मिस्टर सुरेश कुमार राठौर प्रेसिडेंट कोलोकेशन बिजनेस कंट्रोल एस डेटा सेंटर्स लिमिटेड मिस्टर तुषार कपाड़िया टेलीकॉम इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर कंसल्टेंट मॉडरेटर मिस्टर रौनक माहेश्वरी एग्जीक्यूटिव डायरेक्टर एक्सट्रीम इंटरनेट एक्सचेंज थैंक यू For this one, I have an opening statement uh, created. <clears throat> By the way, um, kudos to the organizers. They have been able to get so many mails away from the Karwa Chauth Vrat of their females. <laughs> and kudos to all the females who are hosting the fast. For, you know, <clears throat> our, uh, our age is growing. So anyways, coming to the issue at hand. Uh, India is uh, having the second largest number of mobile users, mobile internet users. However, our penetration is 58.6%. This is as per latest TRAI reports. We rank 114th in mobile penetration or internet penetration among the 192 countries that I am aware of. Government of India in 2018 declared in National Digital Communi Communications Policy that it wants to create enabling framework enabling regulatory framework for making India a global hub for cloud computing, content hosting and content delivery, which is a very amazing vision. The political vision is very amazing. We are, everyone here is already aware that we are far from there. This discussion is a humble attempt to bring the industry stakeholders on the same panel and discuss what is the distance we need to travel. How does Global Hub look like uh, in practical terms? What does a good vision look like from 10 years from now? And maybe reach some kind of uh, you know, idea about what policy uh, we would like to recommend to government to bring in to enable that vision. So I have uh, uh, Mr. Ripunjay, uh, he is the founder of Sugarbox. Mr. Suresh Rathod, who is from Controllers Data Centers. Mr. Tushar Kapadia, who is ex-VP GTL Infrastructure for Strategic Initiatives. And uh, Mr. Rohit from the Quantum Hub, who is into policy research. And he will be giving us uh, best practices uh, uh, that happens across the globe. So, I would like to start with Ripunjay. You know, what do we mean by making uh, India a global hub of cloud and content? I mean, where does India stand currently when compared to other countries in the world and what are the possibilities? So, thanks. Uh, from the cloud and content hub being the first part of it, uh, the basic place where India stands today is we already are producing content. We have always been producing content. We are, the, I think, one of the largest people who churn out the largest amount of movies across the world. Uh, but they've always been the linear format. People going to a movie theater to consume all of that. Uh, with the whole transition that India has seen over the last a decade or so, uh, of us getting onto the mobile bandwagon, getting us all digitized and all, uh, the whole content creation part has shifted from a very high-end studio to somebody who can actually go out and produce content right in their house. Uh, you have enough and more mom and pop shops going out and creating content on YouTube and uh, delivering it out there. You have enough and more people creating content on in their houses, being the master chefs they are at. Uh, all of that is getting us somewhere. Uh, we definitely aren't there yet. Uh, we don't have, uh, we have enough and more restrictions on what can be created, how it can be distributed, where it can be distributed to. Uh, that is where the whole content hub is lagging behind. But to create India as a content creation hub, uh, the government is definitely, and like you rightly said, uh, the policies are in place. The government is sort of agreeing to that we need to get some place. Uh, but 
finally getting there is going to take a lot more push more from the, uh, the government side also. Technology definitely is all across the place. Technology, I think we already are at the forefront of everything that has been there. Uh, but delivering it to the final end user is still going to take a bit of time. Uh, once you have the content in place, uh, cloud becomes the place where you start distributing it. And, and I think uh, the last panel, the current panel, um, uh, is already there in ensuring the data centers are in place, the IXs are in place, to go out and get it delivered out. Uh, at Sugarbox, what we are trying to do is augment all of it by going right at the eyeballs itself. We are looking at going right in the village, we are going at right in the train, the airplanes and everything to ensure the content consumption is there. Uh, but ultimately, the whole ecosystem, which is the IX, which is the ISP, which is the data centers, the cloud companies who will store and be able to go out and distribute the content still needs to come around. So that is where we are at. So basically what you're saying is a lot more in a lot many domains need to happen for us to be, you know, uh, called, the called the content hub. Okay, okay. Um, and data centers are very important part of it. So coming to you, Suresh, uh, you represent data centers, uh, which is a very important part of the ecosystem. Um, so apart from data centers, I mean, and according to you, what other elements need to come together in the ecosystem to make this vision possible? And what are the constraints that we see across the chain? Uh, thanks, Ronak. Uh, uh, taking the first question as well, uh, if you see how India can become a global hub of data center, and what is the what do you mean by global hub? Now, if you see, we are already a automobile exporter. I think uh, not the largest one, but the sub substantial amount of automobile are getting exported from India, getting manufactured in India, which was not the case a decade back. If you take back yourself to decade back, there was no Amazon here in India, there was no Google. Even if they were there, we were served from different countries. Now finally, when they saw the traction here, they all come here. Now if you see what is happening in geopolitically, uh, Hong Kong, if you see most of the large banks had put up their data center in Hong Kong because it was like middle and uh, government policies were so favorable. But uh, with the geopolitical uh, regions now, Hong Kong is losing out the space in data center. What's happening to Singapore? It's a small country. Most of the neutral companies put up their data center there in Singapore, but because of the lack of space, lack of power, they are losing out. So can India capitalize on these opportunities which are thrown by various regions? And that's precisely why I will focus that yes, and that's what we've been happening. Now, if you see what's happening in India, just a decade back, we were, we had just started renewable energy plants, you know, I think today we are already 10% of the renewable, 10% uh, of the energy consumed in India are renewable, mostly from solar. And the plans are by 2030 and which our uh, Prime Minister has signed on a dotted line that we'll almost use 30% of uh, renewable energy uh, sources, you know, uh, from a fossil. Now, what all, what all things data center needs to become a global hub? A cheap power, a renewable power, so that most of the large data center consumer, they have committed to their board that, you know, okay, fine, by 2035, by 2040, I will have this percentage of my data center energy consumption from uh, renewable sources. Third, the, the local data consumption, we are 140 crore population, the amount of data which we are generating and we are consuming and we are using is Herculean. Uh, cheap manpower, cost effective I would say, not the cheap but the cost effective manpower who knows how to run data center, who knows what are the sensitivities involved. You can't be down even for a second, you know, because a data center going down for a second can have a catastrophic failure for four hours for the uh, application to boot up. So. Are we sensitive to all these needs globally? I think data center industry in general and particularly uh, from an uh, Indian player perspective, I think they have gained that expertise over last decade or so. And now I think they have also a scale to buy for a, uh, for a global pie. And I think we have all the right ingredients. Uh, somebody talking in the last panel, government support. You will be amazed, uh, um, Ronak, to know that most of the state governments are competing with each other uh, by throwing so much, so many of, uh, 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 I would call, uh, you know, uh, facilities which were never the case earlier, you know. Now, 
I know the large hyperscaler when they were wanting to decide amongst two states. Now MP and Telangana was fighting neck to neck. It is like last, I think the local government changed and it tilted towards Telangana. But till such time, it was like Chhattisgarh would have got that big deal uh, of uh, having a 100 megawatt data center in three of them. Now, 300 megawatt data center in any 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 state would have been a, a game changer because the amount of GST it accrues and every five years those uh, hardware has to change. So every five years you get 18% GSTs and all those stuff is a big revenue. And then what happened? Another hyperscaler follows. It's exactly the same. Like if if your colleague buys a Mercedes, you want to own it immediately. Similarly, the hyperscaler. One has gone to another uh, state, the second one has followed, the third, third one is following, it's, it's entirely changing. So I think that's precisely what we need, governmental support, industry, uh, where we are, I think we will get a lot of these opportunities to become global hub. I think we will get. I'm very positive about it. Thanks, Suresh. Uh, moving on to the infrastructure side of this, Mr. Tushar, he's uh, ex-VP GTL uh, Infra for strategic, strategic Initiatives. Uh, Tushar, you know, when we talk about an ambition like making India a global hub for cloud and content, telecom infrastructure is a very important part of this. What does this ambition mean for infrastructure operators? Where does the country stand now and where do we need to be? How far we have come from where we started? Where do we stand now? You know, in say five, seven years from now, what do we need to do now so that we can achieve this vision of global hub? Good afternoon all. Thanks Ronak for this introduction. And the question is multifold. Therefore, the answer also will be touching upon couple of uh, the aspects. I'll start with where we have reached today. And to know where we have reached today, let's look back at uh, 1990 when there was only wireline telephony available and the teledensity was less than 5%. We all were waiting for our telephone lines to have a communication facility at home. Then came mobile cellular licenses in 1995 and the mobile networks, wireless networks started rolling out. But still, by year 2000, the teledensity had reached just 10%. Now, as against that teledensity of 10%, the teledensity of UK, US had far exceeded 50 and 60. So that was the gap between the developed countries and the country like India. Uh, telecom operators did uh, roll out a lot of telecom sites. The subscriber base started increasing. And then came a tipping, po tipping point in 2005-06 when huge subscriber growth happened, especially after the calling party pays uh, regime was changed. The subscriber got more and more affordable communication wireless facilities. And that growth definitely also enabled India's economic growth. Everybody knows economic growth requires robust telecom infrastructure network. The telecom operators at that time were trying to optimize their costs and sharing became essential part of uh, the cost reduction. Then came the entities called telecom infrastructure providers or travel companies who took the responsibility of managing and rolling out the passive infrastructure by themselves and allowing the telecom operators to focus on their core area of running the networks, managing the subscriber and growing the subscriber base. So that happened for another 15 years. And today in 2022, the overall tele density is around 89%. Majority of that is dominated by still the urban area where the teledensity is about 138, but still rural density is less than 60%. Now, there is a message in that, that there is di digital divide between the rural and the urban class. Now, to answer to the remaining points, I would like to go back to the title of this today's session, Unchaining the Elephant. Now, when we want to unchain an elephant, what it requires is rethinking our ideas, our ideologies. What we have achieved is tremendous and therefore we have the potential to go to global scale if we are having the right vision and the right actions. Now the right actions will not happen by individual entities. It will be collective efforts. And that is where this kind of discussions, awareness will make 
a clear vision map which can be given a rec as a recommendation to the government, to the policy uh, makers. And there will be more and more participation. So I guess uh, telecom infrastructure has done a lot of job in last 15 years and whatever is there to be done to become the global hub, I think we have the potential. So I would not be disheartened by the gap between the uh, European market or American market and India. We have the potential and the way we have performed in last 10-15 years, I'm sure all of your participation is also making sense that we are aware of what is done and what can be done. And the talent is enormous in India. So I would like to you know, talk about a few more points in this question itself, Sushar, and for the benefit of the audience here. Uh, India has about approximately, so I am not an expert so I don't have accurate figures, but India has about approximately 3.5 lakh uh, telecom towers. Out of this, 30% of telecom towers are fiberized. Now we are, uh, average speeds per telecom tower that is available now is about 100 to 200 Mbps. And this is okay for say 4G connectivity, I mean we all get about average 2 Mbps on our mobile phones, which is decent. But if we are launching 5G, now 5G will require about 7-8 times more number of towers and about 80% of these towers have to be fiberized. So what I am trying to do here is just putting in perspective that if we want to have an effective 5G even, I mean Global Hub is beyond 5G, even if we want to have an effective 5G network and more internet penetration, the amount of work that needs to happen is tremendously large. So while we have, while Tushar is right, we have covered a lot of distance since 1990s. But what we need to cover is still much more than uh, what needs to happen and coming back to you Dushar about these figures, uh, the later part of my question was, what do you think should happen now so that you know this vision of achieving a global hub gets enabled with respect to all the stakeholders of the internet connectivity domain? Yeah, very good question. Let's look at a couple of developments. Just in the recently concluded auctions of uh, 5G spectrum, about 1.4 lakh crore rupees worth spectrum is committed by the major telecom operators for their 5G rollouts. You can understand their stakes are so high. It is not for the telecom infrastructure providers alone to think of the problem and solutions. The entire fraternity connected in the telecom industry is trying to leverage the situations and uh, make it a success in the coming years. Yes, you are right, fiberization of towers is 30%, but out of that also, the challenges are plenty. The remaining 70%, why they did not get fiberized? If we try to look at, what we understand is, the country has focused more on fiber highways, thanks to the independent companies like uh, Gale, Railtail, uh, Power Grid Corporation and then Bharat Broadband's vision of making entire country fiber connected. Now those are fiber highways that is still not solving the last mile connectivity and that is where there is a scope for new and new entities, fiber players to make that gap filled in providing fiber connectivity up to the tower doorsteps. This cannot be left only to government. There is definitely a role which uh, the new players called fiber operators will have to play and will be able to leverage this situation. There are highways available, fiber highways. Now what it requires is the last mile connectivity of last few hundred meters or a kilometer or two from the available nearest point. Now that is where the ch another level of challenges need to be understood. This fiberization in uh, rural uh, may not be immediately viable, but in urban area, while there is an economic viability, the challenges are getting the right of way. Now digging the roads is not that easy, municipalities may not allow it. And that is where smart city concept has to be now extended to all those cities which were not covered in smart, smart city area and have a kind of a holistic town planning of those areas where some kind of a ducts, common ducts can be laid so that it does not require to dig for every new tower to be installed. 
So this will be one solution to be addressed. Another point to be noted is for 5G rollout, it will not be primarily the conventional macro towers servicing those areas. There is a big role of small cells. Now, as you would be aware, small cells are small BTSs which are having smaller footprint and smaller physical size. Now, those small cells would require to be deployed and for that deployment, fiber connectivity at uh, maybe light poles, uh, roadside, etc. are going to be important. Smart cities in some of the locations have done it wonderfully by advanced planning. Now, this is a queue which the local governments as well as the policy makers can think of while making town planning or while revisiting the town planning. Now, that will enable fiber connectivity of towers and for 5G networks, if fiber connectivity is not there, I think the network will not do the justice of the investments which is taking. So, we are hopeful that there will be more and more fiber connectivity in coming years. And now what is happening is, there are so many moving blocks which are required to be dotted into the overall objectives. See, when government announced the fiber, I mean 5G rollouts in recently, the mobile handset manufacturers perhaps not ready or the, or the uh, mobile uh, operating system manufacturers were not ready, the Apples and the Samsungs of the world. But it is Government of India's initiative that now they are put on fast track and that is going to happen. So we should be able to visualize what is required to be done and I am sure government will be able to mobilize those resources as well. I just want to add a point. I think uh, it is a uh, good saying in corporate, something which can be measured can be improved. So I think the way entire government of India ran a Swachh Bharat program wherein most of the cities are competing with each other and we see uh, here is that Bharat Net has a very ambitious agenda of connecting all rural uh, you know, habitations. Uh, over the last couple of years, ever since it has been announced, it has connected about 1.8 lakh panchayats. But the quality of that connection is not good enough. As a result, a lot of those are underutilized. Private sector participation is less because when recently government rolled out a tender to invite private sector to come build, lay those lines, uh, a lot of people didn't apply. And that is a problematic policy because people feel that there is not going to be enough revenue, uh, you know, there is no certainty. So how contracts are structured, how government is doing bidding is constraining how internet penetration is increasing. Similarly, is government investing enough in creating laws that allow easy interconnection, uh, you know, how is data privacy, etc. being done and I can go into more of these things later. But if government were to design more conducive policy, I think we can grow way faster. And that is with regard to data centers. Uh, and Suresh, you are right that states are competing with regard to data centers, but power availability is a very big problem in India. Uh, then, uh, you know, we don't have enough skilled manpower. Uh, in comparison, uh, in states in the US actually compete on sales tax also. They reduce sales tax, they reduce property taxes, they have better connectivity, they have better power. And all of that is essential to then getting, you know, content basically get picked up faster. Uh, so that, that would be my initial comment and I'm happy to sort of go into more later. Okay, um, the round one is finished. I mean, we have audience here, a lot of them. Uh, looks like this is an interesting discussion for everyone. Um, I would like to go to the audience to have any intermediary questions, if any, because before I go for round two. Uh, so, one question to you, sir. Uh, you know, in, in India, there are a lot of uh, IP1, you know, players who had come in as a, uh, you know, neutral infrastructure provider. But I don't see a big growth in that. Is there any uh, thoughts about it? Ki why people are not progressing on the IP1 where, you know, like global, if you see uh, all those all those major players who are like Starlight, you know, it's, it's not picking it up. If you ask me about the ISP, because there is no infrastructure provider who does the neutral infrastructure as, as such where, you know, everywhere it is available. So the, the numbers are not going up. It's like the initial phase, what they have done, it is there. But it's not really growing up because I don't think the neutral infrastructure is paying the, or the ROI is happening. So do you have any thoughts on the neutral infrastructure player? Very good question and definitely 
there will be a lot of insights into when I respond. Uh, if we look at uh, the infrastructure providers community in US, specifically the telecom tower uh, providers, the likes of American Towers, Crown Castle, etc. They have remained absolutely independent, third party. And uh, either there is no investment stake of the telecom operators in those companies or it would be minority. And therefore, what is happening is the infrastructure providers have their own uh, identity as a formidable business entity enabling the telecom infrastructure growth. That needs to be understood. It's not a question of a zero-sum game wherein telecom operators should gain and the infrastructure provider or the ecosystem should suffer. This kind of uh, I win, you lose situations have perhaps created some kind of a bottlenecks. So when it comes to making business viability for infrastructure investments, may it be for fiber, may it be for towers, or may it be for any other infrastructure which is enabling the telecom and IT growth. Our thinking should be more of a kind of a collective success rather than only myopic view of making my business success. Because huge capital investments cannot be recovered in few months. So it's a matter of long years of gestation and therefore it requires robust strategies to make business cases. Now it is not for bailing out the infrastructure companies that government can do something. It is for the telecom fraternity to understand that collectively more than 10 lakh crore rupees have already been invested. Now let's see to it that the boat sails rather than it sinks. And that will be the success of each of each constituent of the industry. I am not talking of only the tower companies. So if that approach is understood by the players, there will be more and more win-win situations, win-win engagements possible. And there will be also a place for new players to enter. It's not a question of how big you are, because when you enter, you may not have grown, but you should find at least a potential to grow. And that will happen when all of us understand that we are complementing each other's strength. We are not cutting into each other. So, so also, you, don't you think the, the declining ARPUs, you know, that also is becoming a problem for, you know, the, I am not the right person to comment on this, but I am just asking you as a thought process, you know, the, because of the declining ARPUs, the, you know, the revenues are not coming in. So okay. that may be the factor where people are not getting the actual uh, results of the FTTH or this kind of a setup. Yeah, uh, we all are aware that India's telecom rates, calling rates or even the data rates are among the cheapest in the world. So the subscriber has benefited a lot in last 10 years. Now that has come at some cost. So that is the time to rethink the equations. See COVID, we understood that okay, it was an unprecedented situation and after COVID, new normals were created in our way of working, way of appreciating some other entities' efforts. Similarly, now the telecom industry requires to make new normals of cost points. And then every business entity is there for business, not for charity. And therefore, I should not be interested in reducing your profits. I should get some profit at my end and justify by providing that kind of services. If that approach is there, I think the players will be having more and more harmony. Uh, because ARPU is not a subject of the telecom infrastructure party, so therefore I will not go too much into the specifics of that. But somewhere we must understand that Indian subscribers have benefited with the lowest rates now to get good quality services, higher technologies such as 5G, perhaps the price points will require to be revisited. Um, <clears throat> I would like to uh, pinch in with a couple of points and maybe a question here. Uh, while it is right that Indian consumers are having the lowest prices in the world maybe, at the same time the telecom operators or telecom service providers are paying the highest taxes in the world anywhere. Right? So there is a 
what i want to point out here is to maybe uh, the government may need to think of telecom as a affirmative action just like mobility in india in many places affirmative action right if people will move they will spend money they will earn money economy will grow similarly maybe a telecom also needs to be looked from this perspective from government's angle that if people will connect to each other there will be more business done and revenues will grow and uh, and maybe one of the aspects that government needs to look into is enabling uh ROWs for example you know reducing the price of ROWs maybe removing the price of ROWs completely uh, putting common ducts maybe uh, <clears throat> removing taxes i mean we have USOF in USOF we have 60000 crore rupees which has not been spent the government has been collecting this money but it has not been spent in anything we have not achieved any objective of the USOF as a country so does it does it not i mean again question to dushar sir does it Here, not uh, ronak yeah, just uh, i have a comment yeah, yeah. Uh, actually uh, what we have outsourced our whole digital india to far four or five telcos maybe bsnl and bharat net and all this i have a privilege to work in more villages now more than 95% of india is not covered with the any kind of net it's very difficult what about the bharat net 1.8 villages or whatever it is more than 50 to 60% are defunct not working uh bsn is in all also and their cost is very very high if you ask for a fiber they will ask you the 30% of 40% of the revenue that is not rationalized or whatever it is what i feel that instead of outsourcing all this thing to the telcos Uh, some private companies why can't we have include all the corporate ngos community network and all this thing which is already there in the directory we cannot think of a community network we can take a, some back call from the some isp so that we can put 1.4 billion people to out a way to regulate it so going in if sometimes the tendency of the government is to ban something or disallow something unless proven otherwise a better tendency sometimes is to allow something unless it needs to be regulated so uh, and this is the a little bit of a change in mindset that i think that industry needs to try to get to the government to do so that things become faster and you know tech can also develop faster and i think uh, my main takeaway would be that the industry needs to do better advocacy with the government and also educate the government i know you guys are already doing a lot and there are a lot of conversations that happen but given the gap in understanding and like for instance even when you spoke about bharat net and you know how there are other complications i'm not even sure if all bureaucrats understood it as well when they were starting it and therefore it's not to say that somebody intentionally committed a you know made a uh, this thing it's a difficult problem to solve so i think there is a need for collaboration there is a need for stronger advocacy and for advocacy where the industry comes together and not each player for themselves but as uh, tushar sir was saying that all ecosystem players come together and talk to the government regularly to make sure that policy is conducive uh, is is what i would end at yeah that is also my 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 key takeaway is also similar that we as industry stakeholders need to come together maybe possibly on a common association and you know brainstorm and uh, educate the bureaucrats and maybe help government create enabling regulatory framework so any questions any last questions from the audience uh, i am sorry we don't have time because the other panelist has already come here so i would request the speakers to please remain on the dais uh, we would request mr rahul acharya strategic advisor of nunberg messe to please give away a memento to the speakers i am so sorry guys the time was really short for this sort of a discussion maybe next time we'll have more time